everyone's doing well? Yes. You feel excited yeah. about this conversation? I just, I, oh, okay. Well, do you just feel excited? I got some yeses in there. Okay. Well, I hope this is, um, does not put you to sleep. Um, after lunch is always a difficult time to have a conversation. Can I just ask before I talk about this? Uh, did you all find, I mean, any of the conversations that we've had either with me or the other people that have talked, um, I know Father Lundberg was in answering questions. Um, have you found these conversations in the afternoon to be helpful? Are they addressing things that you actually have questions about? Are they helping you think about things a little bit more consistently and clearly? Okay, uh, good. Was the one about prayer helpful in any way? Okay. If you do it, from my perspective, uh, if I were in your shoes, the, the things that I had questions about when I was kind of trying to understand the faith and grow in the faith were, well, what we're talking about today, like stuff that deals with how people are supposed to act, morality, but then also how we're supposed to interact with God, which was prayer. So if you find in the next couple weeks that you want to kind of loop back around to something that relates to prayer, I don't know if all of the topics are 100% set in stone, but if there are things that pertain to the spiritual life that you do want to talk about or have more opportunities to ask questions about, this is the time to do it. So, um, you know, I don't know who it is that you speak to, Chris, maybe, but um, yeah, this is the time to ask. So today we're, I'm just going to, I'm sure some of you have, in these conversations, have talked about so what we call same-sex attraction, transgenderism, like those that deal with those crosses, those that have members of their family. And, and maybe some of you have some of these desires or attractions. So it's kind of an understanding of how does a person that experiences those things, how do they fit into the story of faith, right? Um, so if you all watch television, you've heard of that, right, television? Okay. Um, <laughs> movies. Um, so when you guys uh, are, are watching Movies or listening to TV, listening to music, I mean. Um, I'm sure you, all, all, tell me if you disagree with this. The way that the world understands um, how a person is to, to um, live out their sexuality differs from what the church in, encourages. Do you agree with that? Yes. In general? Okay. Um, would you agree that whether or not you agree with this, but do you agree that a lot of people think that what the church teaches or what the church is perceived to teach about gay people or trans people or any of the other identities um, that the church and you, by being members of the church, are hateful? Would you agree that that's maybe a little bit of an experience? No? Okay, at least for some. Have any of you been called hateful because you're... Catholic? Have any, been, have any of you ever been called uh, you know, homophobic or transphobic? You have? Okay. Anyone? Okay. So, <clears throat> this is, Chris said it very well. This is a very important topic. In my experience as a priest, and maybe your own experience, if you were to tell someone who is not a Catholic that you are a Catholic, or if you were to talk to someone who is kind of trying to understand their faith, it is going to be how the church talks about gay people and trans people that is going to be in the forefront of their mind. Because it makes sense that if you are a person of faith, you, you want to belong to a church community that is loving, right? No one, not many people want to join a community that, that hates people, right? So if you perceive that uh, there's a, an entire community of people that the, the team that you want to belong to hates, like actively hates, do you think a lot of people are going to want to join that? And why this is important, because if you don't understand what the church, and I'll, I'll clarify my language, but if you don't understand what we believe as Christians, then you're not going to be able to share it with other people who are trying to find Christ. Because in many ways, it is many people's perception about what Catholics and what Christians believe about gay people and trans people that is an almost impenetrable wall between them and a relationship with Jesus, okay? So you guys, in your own faith, if you have those questions, right, there's a part of your mind that says maybe in your own experience 
or just what you, um, you know, kind of what you've heard about is that the church hates certain groups of people or hates, you know, certain lifestyles. If you have that in your heart, when someone comes up and asks you about it, you're going to probably, you're going to be on the defensive. You're, you're not going to know what to say. So that might affect how you relate to them, but it also might cause you problems in your own faith, right? I would imagine most of you do not want to follow a God who just identifies categories of people and says, well, I hate you, and I hate you, and uh, you know, if you follow all of these rules, and maybe I'll love you. That's not the God that we proclaim as Christians. That's not the God that we serve, one that is arbitrary when it comes to hating. So this is why this is important. I'm not going to be able to say everything that needs to be said. Some of you may fall asleep in the middle of my speaking, which, you know, okay. Um, but I sent to Chris uh, an, a, uh, an email of resources. So most of them are YouTube videos. Some of them are written things. So for those of you that are in like high school and college, um, which is everyone, right? Isn't everyone in high school or college? Mostly, or close to it, or the equivalent thereof. So, or after college. I know there are some, some of us that are out of college. Um, but uh, there are resources, so if you don't feel that this was satisfactory, there are at least other things you can kind of look and listen to different perspectives on this. Um, okay, and I want to make sure that we have at least a couple minutes at the end for, for questions. So I just want to start with, I'll start with this. Um, I'll approach this from the perspective of the faith, right? I'm a priest, we're, all, we're Catholic, we're here, at the, we're here at Sash. So I want you to hear it from the perspective of faith. Number one. This is just something for you to keep in mind, because you'll hear this when people get into a conversation about this issue. So same-sex attraction, people that struggle with their sexuality, people that are married outside the church, abortion, women priests, all these different things. Any moral issue that will come across, you will hear people say, well, the church says this, right? The church says that, you know, whatever it is. The church says that um, um, people having... Uh, being attracted to people of the same sex is wrong. Right? That, that's what people think. The church says that this is wrong. Well, let me just clarify this. Anytime the church speaks definitively about the faith, it's not the church that's saying anything. Right? The church is the chosen mouthpiece. It's Christ that's saying it. So whenever you get yourself, you're hearing people say like, well, you know, the church says this, but Jesus says this other thing. Right? The church says that gay people can't get married, but I think Jesus really would say, you know, whatever they want. Just hear what you're saying. If you, whenever you get into a position where you are disagreeing with, and I'm not talking about like, you know, Pope Francis walks out on the, the balcony in the Vatican and says, you know what? I really, really, really like chocolate ice cream. And I, th <laughs> I think a lot of people should like chocolate ice cream. My dad's allergic to chocolate. Does that mean my dad now is in disagreement with the Pope? And he's not a good Catholic because he does not like chocolate ice cream because he's allergic to it and makes him vomit. No. So there's a difference between something a Catholic says and something that the church teaches with authority. Okay? And we know what the church teaches with authority because it's written in a little book called the Catechism. So when the church teaches something, it's not the church teaching. It is Jesus teaching. So whenever someone comes up and says, well, the church teaches this. And you know it's not something like Pope Francis saying that he likes chocolate ice cream and you should like chocolate ice cream too. You know it's a little bit more serious than that. Hear what you're actually saying, or I disagree with the church about this. What you're actually saying is I disagree with Christ. Because Jesus said it in the scriptures. He said, you know, to Peter I give you the keys, so what you bind is bound and what you loose is loose. But he also said in Luke's gospel, he said, when they hear you, he gave the, key, he gave the authority to the apostles, so the bishops and the church hierarchical, he said, when they hear you, they hear me, right? I am speaking through you. There is no difference in voice. So what the church says is just Jesus speaking. So when we talk about things, when it comes to the moral life, it's not like, well, you know, Jesus probably has a different opinion than what, you know, this random set of bishops came up with. No, when the bishops speak, it is Jesus who is speaking, not the bishops. Another thing, when we talk about um, being gay, being trans, or any of the other many varied sexual identifications. Everyone knows that there are many, many different sexual identities out there, right? Or gender identities, there's all different sorts. You've heard this, right? You guys know this? Okay. Um, I just want you to know that from the perspective of the world, right, and maybe this is something that you kind of buy into, and you just have to check yourself on this, 
there's a whole bunch of assumptions that everyone believes, which makes it more difficult to follow what our Lord teaches through the church. So tell me if, you, if these sound, well, these are true, but tell me if they sound a little bit like assumptions that you may have. Number one, people believe, like we believe, that the, the only way, like the, the, the best way to show a person love, like in order to truly love a person, you have to be able to have sex with the person that you love, right? So that's like the real, the real core of it. You have to be able to have sex with the person that you love. Um, the second thing is that uh, if you are going to love me, you have to love me in the way I want to be loved, meaning you can't disagree with me, right? If you make me, if you disagree with me or tell me that what I'm doing is wrong, that's you, um, that's you showing hatred towards me, bigotry towards me because you're judging me, because you think what I'm doing is wrong. So that's bad, right? It's bad to be judgmental. So that means you have to affirm people wherever they are because that's their experience. And uh, the other thing is whatever makes you feel good is good and should be celebrated. Do those sound at least a little bit right? I don't know, when you have a, you might not believe them, but the average person that you come up against, against, not even your friends or people that you talk to, a lot of them will believe that. This is why, I mean, if you believe that the highest way of showing love is to have sex with a person, and if you believe that in order to have a fulfilled life, you have to be able to be with the person that you love in the way that you want to, and no one can talk to you against it because that's what makes you feel good, this is why people would say, if you tell a person that's living in a way differently from you, if the church tells certain groups of people, you cannot live that way, that's the church being hateful. If you correct someone and say, I love you, but I disagree with the way that you're living, you are being hateful um, because people believe. And then, specifically when it comes to our gay brothers and sisters, or lesbian brothers and sisters, those that are attracted to, to, to people of the same sex, we would say, they would say that there's no place in the church because what makes them happy, what makes them fulfilled, and what is going to be the part of their life that fulfills them, being able to be with the person they love in a sexual way, when the church says you cannot do that, they say then what you're telling us is that we can never be happy. Why would I want to, why, what type of God doesn't want me to be happy? What type of church community doesn't want me to be happy? So that's why they, 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 feel, they feel like they are not welcome because what they believe is going to make them happy is being told that they cannot do, can never do. So those are a lot of the assumptions that uh, people believe. Where do we come at it from as Catholics? Where do we come at it as Christians? Well, first of all, um, we always, whenever you think about what we are supposed to do in our life of faith, we always look first and foremost to Jesus. We look at his life, we look at how he acted and thought, we look at what he said, and that is our standard for how we judge everything. So, if someone ever comes up to you or says to you, or you even believe, that the only way to have a fulfilled life, this side of heaven, is to have sex with someone, okay? That is the only way that you can show love and be fulfilled. Your answer to that should be, that is not of God. How do we know this? The two people in the world that lived the, the most fulfilled life were Jesus and Mary, right? And neither of them had sex with anyone, okay? So if you think that to not have sex is to somehow not be fulfilled, just know that that is a lie, okay? So when people say, I, in order to live a fulfilled life, I have to be able to have a relationship with someone in a sexual way, that's just not Christian. It's not Christian. It also gives a lot of hope, because when people are told that they can't be married to someone, or they can't have a relationship with someone, to be able to offer them the hope of Jesus and Mary, and say, you can live a beautiful life um, without having sexual relations with anyone. And this is the other thing, for you all to know, and for us to know, and to boldly proclaim to others. The highest experience of human fulfillment, the highest experience of human love, is not sexual union. That's a way of expressing love. But the highest way, and the church has always taught this, is what's called friendship, or communion. First of all, communion with God, and then communion with our brothers and sisters in faith. 
Sometimes we are called to communion in a very particular way called marriage, right? But always we are called to communion with God. That's why the church focuses a lot of time on sin. Not because we're constantly condemning people, but Jesus doesn't, sin is what separates us from communion with God. So the church calls out sin because it's the thing that's going to make us not happy. Anything that is sinful makes us unhappy because anything that is sinful separates us from God. And sometimes we, the church and Jesus are more clear about things that people are more likely to fall into when it comes to sin. Sexual sin being one of them. So, very important for you to know that about the idea. Of sex isn't the only way to show love. Being sexually with someone is not the only way to reach fulfillment. Why do we know this? Because we look to Jesus. And we can always have hope in looking at his life and the fact that he did not have sexual relations and was the perfect fulfillment of what it is to be a human being. So, a line from the catechism that you can memorize, because this is the one that really gets um, um, confused. This is the passage on people that, that struggle with same-sex attraction in the catechism. It says, a, a sexual attraction to a person of the same sex is disordered. Acting on that, so any action where you act on that attraction is sinful, objectively sinful, and always sinful. The people who have these attractions are wonderful children of God and should not be treated with discrimination, harshness, or hatred. Okay? So, just a quick story. Mother Teresa was once interviewed uh, on television. You all know who Mother Teresa is, right? <laughs> I want to check. Um, so, Mother Teresa was interviewed on television, and I think it was at a time when they were passing, um, well, here, here's one of your little tidbits that you can use if anyone says that the Catholic Church is homophobic. When the, you all know what AIDS is? You've heard about the AIDS epidemic in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, okay? So this is when they didn't really understand what the, the virus, you know, HIV is the virus, AIDS is the, 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 you know, the illness. They didn't necessarily know where AIDS was coming from. It was a debilitating disease. It was disproportionately affecting those in the gay male community, right? And um, everyone was celebrating gay rights. But do you want to know who the first, the first organization to establish a hospice for gay men with AIDS was, right? The guys that were dying from AIDS. It was Mother Teresa's sisters in New York, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. So you can go to D.C. right now, and you can visit. It's called Gift of Peace, and it was the AIDS hospice, still run by the Missionaries of Charity, right? So that the men who had AIDS, who were gay men, could die with dignity, right? Could die in a place of peace. Anyway, Mother Teresa was on the news. She was giving an interview, and the man asked her, the interviewer said, so Mother Teresa, how do you and your sisters treat gay people? And she said, you mean precious children of God? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how do you and your sisters treat gay people? She says, precious children of God. He goes, yes, but the gay people, she goes, the precious children of God. And what she was trying to show us is, all of us, is that what it is? All, this whole thing that we have now, labels, all of these labels about people's sexual identity is all, from the perspective of faith, the only label that matters is precious child of God, right? So that's how we treat people. That's how we view people. It doesn't matter how they live. It doesn't matter the choices that they make or how they choose to identify themselves. The only way we see people as precious children of God. Mother Teresa is wonderful. You should just have that story playing. You have, someone comes up and says, I'm this, that, or the other thing. You say, oh, precious child of God. Great, great to meet you. You know, what's your name? But what the church teaches is, so, to be disordered. An attraction is disordered. What does this mean? It means that God, when he created us, established an order in creation, right? There are, things are ordered towards, so like for example, my voice and the way that my voice works is ordered towards you guys being able to hear it, right? The sound waves that are produced, the waves of, you know, of air as it affects the, you know, the, 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 your, your ear canals and goes into your, uh, your, the nerves in your ears, right? Then processes to your brain, right? All of this, my voice and the, my ability to speak is ordered towards you all understanding and hearing what I'm saying in truth. 
That is why when you have an inclination to tell a lie, we would say that desire for you to lie is disordered because the proper order of why you speak and have relationships with people is so that you can tell the truth. When you have a desire to lie, and some of you may or may not have this constant, you're constantly tempted to tell lies, right? Have you, none of you do that, I know. But there are some people that are very liar, lying in pro, pr prone. I think a particular uh, career path where there's lots of people that, you know, bend the truth at least a little bit would be politicians, right? Uh, <laughs> partial truths and, you know, so probably some of them have the disorder of being liars, right? They are inclined to lie, but it's against the order of what they're supposed to be doing. The same thing when it comes to our sexual life. There is an order that was established by God. In the beginning, God created our sexuality so that we would be able to give and exchange love in a particular way and bring new life, right? For so that's for men and women. May I just point out something biological? Here's a little interesting tidbit. I know all of you are big bio fans. You're the science person I know, so. Um, so the only organ system in the human body that makes no sense as a self-enclosed organ system, right? So is the sexual reproductive system, right? I'm gonna use the scientific terms and I apologize if this makes people feel uncomfortable, but the penis and the vagina are completely and totally uh, nonsensical as organs if you don't have a person of the opposite sex, right? Our, our, you know, like our nervous system makes sense, our digestive system makes sense, right? All of these are cardiac, the cardiac, you know, respiratory system. We have a nurse in the house, so if I get any of these wrong. But, you know, like all of our organ systems, our body is a, is a, is a, is a very tightly knit organ system. But the only one that is incomplete in the person itself <coughs> requires another person to be there is the reproductive system. Built into our very structure is the fact that our sexual nature is meant to be a coming together, a complementary coming together of man and woman, right? In a way that could bring new life. So any sort of sexual uh, inclination that is outside of that order, what do you call anything that is not ordered properly? It's disordered, right? That's the word. That's, so anything that is not ordered towards what it's supposed to be doing is called disorder, right? That's why we say that when someone has like, think of any, probably some of you have a medical condition, some of you might have uh, family members that have medical conditions. You would never hope that the doctor walks in and you have like, I don't know, like a third eyeball growing in the middle of your head and says, <laughs> you know, congratulations, you have a new superpower. They'd say, there is something wrong here. It is not supposed to be a, th a third eyeball in the middle of your forehead, right? It is disorder. So the same thing in our moral life. If we're not going towards the way of God, right? as he organized it, right, because he made us, he knows our plan. This is something for you all to, to, to think about. God is the one who knows us because God is the one who created us. So when he gives, right, when he teaches laws, we call them commandments, but when he teaches laws coming from on high, but then we also have things that we know at like the natural level, like you shouldn't eat arsenic, right? Arsenic is a poison, right? Don't put arsenic in your third eyeball on, the, on your head. So when you do that, that would probably be bad. But we have natural things that we know and divine things that we know. All of these are meant to be given by the God who knows us and wants us to be happy more than we want to be happy. That's how much he loves us. So following his law is basically following the uh, guidebook on how the thing is supposed to work, the operator's manual, right? I know that we have uh, Qualen, how do you pronounce your name? Qualenbush, Qualenbush? Qualkinbush. And then who were, you were doing the computer thing, right? Yeah. I don't know with all the other clubs. Someone was making cakes. I know that was happening today because the little kids didn't give me one. But um, <laughs> for, for the priests. But, you know, all of us, when you're do, I'm sure when you're doing your camps as you're preparing, you have to take a little bit of time to figure out what the heck you're supposed to be doing, right? I know the magic people, the, well, the illusionists, it's not magic, pagan. So the illusionists were, uh, that's right. So the illusionists were trying to learn from someone who knows more than them, I'm assuming, or from a book or YouTube or something, on how to do, how to do, yeah, how to do the things that you're supposed to be doing, right? You go to the user, the user manual because 
It is the thing that will guide you as to where you're supposed to be going, trying to get to the place where you're supposed to be going, to use the thing that you have in the way that it's supposed to be used. That's what the divine law is. It's God who is the great love, the, in love created us, has the plan for us, and so he's established an order on how we are to live. So when it comes to our sexual life, God has created an order that we can understand just by looking at our bodies as to how our sexual life is to be lived. To have an attraction or to have an inclination outside of this is to have a disorder, just like any other form of disorder. Now, why is it wrong to violate God's law? That's the next thing. It is always wrong to act on an inclination that is disordered. Well, it's not because we're like offending God. It's not like, you know, God, you gave us this and we don't like you anymore. It's because we're hurting ourselves. If we do not live up to the potential that God has given us, if we do not follow the way that God has made us to lead us to him, we're not hurting him. We're hurting us. And it hurts him that we are hurting ourselves. So whenever the church teaches something is wrong, it's not because we're like somehow invisibly punching Jesus in the face and he's like sitting in heaven just constantly getting bopped around him. Oh, stop. No. He's in heaven. He's risen from the dead. It's like nothing, can, nothing affects him in that way. What breaks his heart is the fact that we would freely choose to not want to be with him. Because only by being with him will we be happy in this life and in the life to come. So when it comes to our sexual life, our brothers and sisters that struggle with their identity, sexual identity or sexual attractions, when their attractions lead them from something outside of marriage between one man and one woman, that's a disordered attraction, just like anyone that's inclined toward lying, drinking too much, stealing, setting things on fire, tripping people in the hallway, like you're just inclined to do that, I just desire to trip someone, right? All of those things are disordered, right? And you have to realize, okay, I just have a disorder. It is not normal for me to just perpetually want to trip someone, right? You have to manage that, right? You manage it with grace and with God's help. If you start acting on the thing, you just, you just become like a, a serial tripper, just always in the hallway stripping people, you would look at it and say, I'm sorry, that is just, it's wrong. It's wrong for you. It's, it was not good for you to have that desire. I don't know where that desire came from, but it's not good for you to be doing it, so that's wrong. Because it's not going to lead you closer to God. Anything that doesn't lead you closer to God, anything that leads you away from Him is going to hurt yourself because you're leading yourself away from happiness and union with Him who grants you fulfillment. So, but then how do we treat people? Like, you're going to run into a lot of people in your life, maybe you already have. How do we treat people that uh, have attractions that are different from ours or live in a way that is different than what Christ teaches? Well, we treat them just like Mother Teresa did. They are precious children of God. Now, the one thing that people do not like is the fact that as Christians, we have a moral obligation. It's even written in one of the windows in the church. So when you go up and pray, I think it's on one of the windows. Look around, because I think on the right side of the church and the stained glass windows are the spiritual works of mercy. One of them is to instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful, right? So instructing the ignorant, when there are people that don't know God's plan, we have a moral obligation as Christians to help them understand it. We don't have to be jerks about it, but we are just supposed to help people. And when they want us to cooperate or, or kind of endorse what they're doing and we know it to be wrong, we have to say in love, I can't do that because you're doing something that's leading you away from God. So when the church says the, the person's attraction is not according to God's order, it's disordered, okay? If you act on this attraction, right, then you are doing something that is wrong because it is against God's order and it's not gonna lead you to be happy with him forever. But how do we treat the people who follow through on these attractions or have these attractions? You treat them like everyone else. Because they're people, we're people, and we're all precious children of God. Whoa. What is that? What was that? A kid. A kid got a walkie-talkie? Oh, oh, dear. It's chaos. Um, okay, let me... Uh, does that make sense? Again, that's probably not the, the full answer every one of your questions. But as I said, there are further resources where they can maybe go a little bit better into it. Um, one thing I will say, I'll, and this will be the, the last thing I say. Um, so, you will probably, during the course of your life, meet people who will expect that in order for you to show Christian love, it means you have to support every single one of their decisions, okay? 
And you would just have to hear this now. You want to be every only thing that matters. The only thing that matters is getting to heaven. That's the only thing that matters. And bringing as many people and helping as many people get to heaven and with you. If you have to, and I'm not saying you should intentionally do this, but if it is the case that you have to lose a friend this side of heaven in order to gain them for eternity, that's the choice you make. There are going to be a lot of people that say, what you need to do is just agree with people's decisions this side of heaven because what you want to do is keep the relationship alive because you might help them eventually. But the reality is, and this is the, whether this goes with a person's sexual life or any of their decisions, usually when you start tolerating a person's bad decisions and sinful decisions, you get used to their sinful decisions and you start to become complacent towards it, right? You start to notice it less and less until the point where you don't think it's sinful anymore, right? And then guess what's happened? You have not moved them closer to heaven. You have just taken a step away from heaven yourself, right? So just remember that in your relationships. Also about the people that struggle with same-sex attraction. This is something very crucial, and this is one of the resources I gave to Chris. You can listen to a priest talk all the time about this is what the church teaches, this is why the church teaches this, it takes us away from heaven, God has an order, sexual, any type of sexual activity outside of marriage that's not oriented towards love and life is wrong. You can say and hear all of those things and it could just be white noise. And especially when it comes to same-sex attraction, um, you know, it's just another priest saying things to you and maybe you agree it agree with it, but you might meet people along the way. The vast majority of people that you'll meet in Winchester don't agree with it. Um, many Catholics don't agree with it. Maybe some of your own family members don't agree with what our Lord teaches through the church. But one thing that I've always found is very helpful. Number one, asking God in your prayer, help me to believe everything that you've taught. If there's something, Lord, that I don't agree with, help me to ask people questions. Okay? Huge. Secondly, listen to people who are living who have these same-sex attractions or who have identified as transgender, listen to those people who, have, who are following the way of Christ, hear their story. Because when you listen to the news, watch TV, talk to people in your families, everyone is saying that the church is hateful. You hear one side of the story. Have you ever heard the side of the story of someone who lived the life as a gay man or woman and then is converted to the faith and is now living chastely? Have you ever heard those stories? Have you ever heard that on the news? Are people singing about that or making movies about that? So some of the resources I gave to Chris are so you can hear those stories. So that when you speak to someone that says the church following Christ and following the church is hateful. You are hateful. You are bigoted. You will now have other people and resources to be able to say, hey, all I can say is I'm following what Christ says. And there are other people who have identified as having these attractions that are also following the way of Christ. And they don't think that Christ is being hateful. In fact, they claim that this is the first time that they've ever truly lived by, being, by living a chaste, you know, a, a sex-free life. It's important for you guys to have those stories. Also, um, yeah, this is just, a, just a, a, a thing. When you meet, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think... The people in, in our community, and this is why you want to treat everyone that has, you know, whether it's a person that identifies as transgender, a person that identifies as gay or lesbian or bisexual, any number of those people. You want to be loving towards them. You want to be a good friend, of course. Um, pray for them, right? Pray for them and pray for yourself. But just realize that uh, in the scriptures it says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. In my opinion, in our day and age, the people that are being prepared to be the greatest of modern saints are those that struggle with their gender and sexuality because the entire world is telling them to turn their back on God, right? So sin is abounding in that community. But where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Anyone that chooses to follow Christ because they're going to get no support are going to be absolute heroes. So when you talk to someone who is what we would call a sexual minority, no matter where they live, Look at them as a future saint, right? Because that's what they are. They are going, when they come back to Christ, they are going to be the greatest of saints. 
because they are going to stand against the world. Um, just, just so you know from my own personal experience, I have worked uh, extensively with families um, who have children that I've, have identified as, as transgender. In fact, I had one family where I, had, I, was, I was present. Um, it was just a very sad situation. But the families, I, I've been with them. Uh, but then also working with uh, men and women who have, who have identified as gay or lesbian. Um, and you'll notice how we use the term, Chris introduced it, we've also used the word, word as same-sex attracted. Can I just say this, this is a very, I don't call, I mean I use it here because it's the, it's the term that, that, that is most identifiable. I, I do not like calling people gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. The reason is because, number one, as Christians, we do not identify ourselves or other people by their sins or weaknesses, right? I don't go, I don't go, I don't do, I don't go up to someone who's, uh, you know, who I happen to know as a priest is struggling with, um, you know, being nice to their kids, and do I, you know, call them, hey, rager, how's it going, you know? I hate drunk, you know, drunky, you know, if someone who's struggling with alcohol or, like, we don't, we, we and, and nor do I want you. Like, you might struggle with something in your life. If you start identifying yourself with your sin or your weakness, then you are not seeing yourself the way God sees you. That's not how he sees you, right? Again, go back to Mother Teresa, precious child of God, precious child, that's the only way God sees you. And that's the only way we should see other people. And when other people start identifying themselves and choosing identifiers, number one, to call yourself gay is to say that my central identity is the person who I'm sexually attracted towards. That's how I built my identity. That is not the way God made us to identify ourselves in that way. So anytime someone introduces himself, and you don't want to be a jerk or rude like, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm gay. No, you're not. You, you know, so you don't have to be like aggressive. But in your own mind, and how you speak to people will notice as you start speaking by the way that we choose to use our language. When you say that someone is same-sex attracted versus saying they are gay, do you, under, do you see the difference in that? To merely, you're pointing out, same-sex attracted is pointing out, and I, I'm recognizing, this is an attraction that I have, but this is not who I am. It's a, it's a, it's a struggle or an, it, it's, it's, it's a cross that I carry. Just like someone says, I am, a recovering alcoholic, or I am, okay, better yet, I'm someone who struggles with alcoholism. You're not an alcoholic. That's not down to who you are. Your identity is your weakness. So in your language and in your, your way of thinking, don't settle on just identifying yourself or other people based on just one part of who you are. It's, it's an impoverishment of who we are as people. And, and quite frankly, because we've kind of, Christians have lost this battle of language, so now it's LGBTQ+, um, so everyone identifies by, as a particular thing. Tell me, so how many of you go to public school? Okay, right, yeah, some, some of you are in college. Hands down, how many of you are homeschooled? Or were homeschooled? Okay, how many of you are, what's the other, I guess Catholic school or private school? Some, okay, right. <laughs> The one, the solid Okay. So I don't know if, I don't know, being that I, I am not homeschooled, clearly I'm, I, I was not homeschooled. I don't know if this is, I also grew up in a different time. Um, and I, Chris, I would imagine this would be kind of for you. Like all of this stuff about the LGBTQ stuff was a little bit when I was in high school, but it was not the way that it is now. So in homeschool, it, you guys may be a little bit, um, I don't know, removed from it. But for those of you that are either in Catholic, private, or public schools, can I, can I just ask, because I, I was made aware of this this past year at our Catholic school, at the last parish I was at. It has now gotten to the point not merely that people are identifying as LGBTQ plus whatever, you know, find your place along the spectrum. There is now basically a subculture in schools where people are being encouraged to find a label for themselves so they can belong. Have you experienced this or heard this? Anyone that goes to school? It's, it's weird. I was sitting with an eighth grade girl, and she was saying that the group of friends that she was with, um, everyone had chosen a different identity. And because she was the only one that just was kind of like hanging back and saying, I, I you know, I guess I'm attracted to guys. You know, I'm in eighth grade, so, you know. Her friends came up to her and said, no, we saw you looking 
or talking or laughing with another girl, you're probably bisexual. And her friends told her that, and she started to say, you want to know what that, I guess that, you know, it's possible, right? It's possible. So there's now, a, there's now pressure, right? Before it was just, you know, don't be a jerk to other people. Now there's an active pressure for everyone to I find a way to identify themselves as something other than a precious child of God. Find a label for yourself. So I want you all to be aware of that so that you can stand against it, right? And not, again, you don't want to be a jerk about it. And I don't know if any of you are going to, especially in the homes, if, you, if in the homeschool community you're starting to get pressure to identify as bisexual or transgender, then you know, go to the headmasters of your school, which would be your parents, I suppose, and, <laughs> um, and you know, report it. But just be aware that that is probably going to be out there. Whether you're in school or whether you're in your workplace in certain groups of friends, there is going to be that pressure. And you as Christian believers are meant to stand against it. Again, not as jerks, but as heroes, right? To not to know we do not identify anyone simply by one aspect of their, their being or one aspect of their experience, one aspect of their, and certainly not their sexual attraction, right? Um, so, that is all. It was kind of, that was, this was called the stream of consciousness. You know, it's kind of told you things. But, um, was that helpful in any way? Maybe just a little bit. Okay, do you have any questions? I know you have to go up and pray. We're good, no questions. Oh, it was good, oh, okay. I just said, do you have any questions? <laughs> yes? You know, if you go on websites, that, uh, like websites that deal with, um, so let me just say, there are at least two apostolates within the church that have been approved, that are faithful to our Lord's teachings, that are in operation. So I sent both of those uh, links to, to Chris if you want to just poke through the website. One is the Courage or Courage Apostolate, and the other one is called the Eden Invitation. The Eden Invitation. So they've got great resources on there. If you go to most other ministries to gay people or trans people, a lot of them are going to focus on we just need to affirm you where you're at, right? Make you feel comfortable where you're at. The other ones are kind of encountering people and then calling them to Christ. So on some of the more um, progressive, and I would say not faithful ministries, they will identify basically any saint who was a guy that had a guy friend or any woman who had a woman friend as gay and lesbian saints. So um, for example, St. John Henry Newman who was canonized last year, he had a very good priest friend um, and they said he was gay. Um, Francis of Assisi, gay. Uh, who, was, who, was, who was the woman? Uh, was, Claire, was Claire gay? I don't know. Basically, every nun was a lesbian, right? I mean, so, that sounds so terrible. Yeah, Therese Lisieux, gay. Uh, but that, that what they would do, and, and it's, it's, again, it's such an impoverishment. It's a digging around to try to find, because what did we just say? The attractions themselves are disordered. Acting on them were sinful, but the people are wonderful. And in the vast, in the in the life of the world, the identifying with your sexual behavior was never what humanity did. We were certainly very sexually promiscuous at different times, but there was always a recognition that this type of lifestyle, because it was not natural, right? It didn't lead to new life. It was always something that was kind of to the side. Now we've taken it as a normal way of life. So even among the saints, if there were some saints, and there probably were saints that struggled with understanding their sexuality, right? It was not something that they talked about because it was just like someone, it was just like struggling with uh, lying, right? I mean, you recognized it as something that wasn't leading you closer to God. You didn't broadcast it to the world. So to the best of my knowledge, and Chris or any of the people that, you know, any, anyone else, if, if you've heard of someone who is, uh, a patron saint of those that are struggling with their sexual identity. I do not know off the top of my head uh, who it is, um, and, and maybe I can look it up. But I know that they, you know, at times they will choose different saints who struggled with their sexuality, just living a life of chastity and temperance. So examples of that would be um, Saint Augustine, 
right? Because he said his great prayer was, Lord, make me pure, but not yet, right? Uh, <laughs> and then also St. Paul, uh, his letter, second letter to the Corinthians, there's the passage, we read it in, in, on, at Sunday Mass a couple weeks ago, the, uh, the letter about his thorn in the flesh, right? This idea of like a, 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 a constant temptation to walk away from God that brought him humility because he knew he shouldn't act on it. He was pulled to act on it, but really it just broke him down so he couldn't be so prideful. So a lot of times they claim St. Paul, not that he was, uh, you know, struggled with his sexuality, but just here is the, here's the same spiritual, um, uh, the same spiritual work that needs to be done in any person that's struggling with any form of sexual sin. I should also say that, I mean, that, that was a great question. The church stands against any form of sexual sin that is outside of marriage, right? So whether with it, it's with a goat or a woman that's not your wife or a guy or five guys or ten women, all of that will lead you away from God. So the church is, is, is our Lord, is very clear. Sex is supposed to be an expression of the love of the Trinity, right? A physical expression of communion that creates. That's what marriage and sexuality are supposed to be. So anything outside of a total commitment and self-sacrificial relationship that is open to life will lead you away from God. So it's not just against homosexuality. It's, there's a lot of heterosexual sin too, right? Um, so quite frankly, probably more of that than there is homosexuals because, simply because there are more people that are, have, a, a, have a properly oriented sexuality that don't live it according to God's plan. That was uh, totally different from the saint, uh, Saint Augustine, and Saint Paul. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Um, so in my experience, a lot of friends have struggled with this. They feel like it's unfair to them because they feel like I want to go on dates, I want to like be in love, I want to experience that, not necessarily sexually, but just in general. And it yeah. seems almost like, well, it's just not fair that I can. Yeah. And, and is I, it even okay for them to date, but in a post-monitory way? I guess that's not the issue. So that, that would be, did, did everyone hear her question? She was saying that there are people that, are, you know, have a sexual orientation or attractions for people of the same sex, and they feel that it's not fair that they miss out on all the various experiences that a person, like, you can go out on a date with a guy, they can't go out on a date with a girl, or if they're a guy, you know. Um, how can we be with people in the midst of that? So one thing is, this is, this is the beautiful thing about the life of faith because we actually have something to say about this. Like, and it's not just like, let me teach you things, you know, suck it up. Um, we act, you can actually point to central teachings and people in the life of faith to say, hey, you are not the only one that is doing this. And I think this is where looking at our Lord, not that our Lord had the perfect sexuality, but he lived a life where he didn't go on any dates, right? He went on a life where he didn't get to experience a lot of the things a lot of us experience, right? Um, and we would still look at him and say, he lived a perfectly fulfilled human life, right? He had to deny himself a lot of things, right? In order for us to have new life. And so, like, this is where just, just talking about Jesus is a way where you could say, hey, I don't understand, like, yes, it, it's, it's, it's true that you are, there are some experiences that you can't have. But with Christ alongside you, you have someone who understands the weight of carrying something where you have to deny yourself for a greater good. Like, Jesus did that. That was his whole life. But you can also point, again, this is where the life of faith. We do not say this very often, but it is something that you can point to. Like, when someone comes up to me and says, you don't understand what it's like to not be able to have sex and you can't go on dates. I'm like, uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, I do. I, I kind of do. So, again, in the life of the church, for you to be able to point out, like, well, you're just, you're called to that life. Yeah, but I don't become, you know, if we want to use labels, I don't somehow become like a eunuch or an asexual being. Like, I, I, I only see God, you know, hello, how are you? Hello, you know, I don't see anything beautiful. No, we too, yes, we have a call, but we discipline according to God's call and plan for our life, we have to cooperate with the grace to bring discipline into our life. Again, this is where, very practically speaking, you can point and say, even in the life of faith, regardless of a person's sexual attraction, people can live a beautiful and grace-filled 
life for the service of others and never go on dates with anyone. Have pure, like you said, perfectly platonic relationships and friendships. How do we know? Because since the beginning of the church, we have upheld the chaste celibate life, right? Almost no other religious group has done that in a way where it's a central part of the faith. And what we say is, if you read, I know all of you go home at night and read the Second Vatican Council documents. So <laughs> as you're going through for a second or third time, uh, rereading re re them after this talk, uh, in the section on, uh, it said, the highest manifestation of love for God is martyrdom. The second highest manifestation of love and unity with God is chastity, celibacy. Be freely renouncing your sexual life for the sake of the kingdom, right? Imagine that being upheld. And then to think grace is also an operation. St. Paul, who was probably a strapping guy, right, was not married, right? He had all the things going for him. He was rich, he was successful, he was well-educated, he was powerful in the Jewish community, and he freely chose to cooperate with the grace of being chaste and celibate. Jesus talks about this too. He said, there are those that are chased by, there are those that are chased because of man, right? They're made eunuchs because of man. They can't get married, right? There are some that are eunuchs because of circumstance. And then there are those that have been called to give up their sexual life for the sake of the kingdom, right? And he says, to these are granted great graces. So what do you do? A person that is, is uh, same-sex attracted and recognizes they're missing out, in no way invalidate their experience or their feelings. But what you can do is say, all of that should lead you closer to Christ because in the church you find the support, the personal experience of Christ and the grace necessary to take what you're going through and to orient it towards service of God and others and to receive the grace to be able to carry the cross. You are missing out on nothing. Only if you look at your sexuality from the eyes of the world do you think that you're missing out. Right? Because if you think that the only way for you to be fulfilled is to be in a romantic relationship with the person that you're sexually attracted to, then yes, we are being unfair, God is being unfair. But if there is actually something greater, that you can be chaste and celibate and totally experience fulfillment, then there's no unfairness at all. It just is the way that God has called you, and it's you bringing yourself around to accept that. That might be a lot to say, you know, just one over one cup of coffee with your friends. But, <laughs>